Hello, and welcome to POMA Does, a podcast produced by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. We provide a voice for osteopathic medicine and share insights on issues important to osteopathic physicians, residents, and students, as well as those who embrace the osteopathic philosophy. POMA's mission is to promote the distinctive philosophy and practice of osteopathic medicine in Pennsylvania for our members and their patients. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the POMA Does podcast series, sponsored by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. I'm Hans Zuckerman. I'm a family practice physician in Pottsville in Schuylkill County, and I'm also the POMA chair of the Government Affairs Committee. And we're here today to talk about how the recent elections are going to impact POMA policy moving forward and our advocacy efforts. So there's three of us on the line today, and I'm going to have us all quickly introduce ourselves. So like I said, I'm the chair of the Government Affairs Committee. Hans Zuckerman. And Seth, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Seth Carter. I am a geriatric and family medicine physician in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I'm the vice chair of the public policy committee. Hi, I'm Tyler Burke from Mill Iron Goodman. I'm an associate and I reside in Harrisburg. So tell us a second about Mill Iron Goodman. They're our contracted lobbyist firm for our advocacy and policy efforts. Yeah, Mill Iron Goodman is a bipartisan lobbying firm that has been in the Harrisburg area since the 1980s. We really like to fly under the radar because that's how we get the most stuff done in Harrisburg. And we really focus in on scope of practice and healthcare issues. And POMA is one of our favorite clients to work with. We waited until today, the 5th of December, to have this as all of those house races and different legislative elections were just kind of still trickling in. I think we had a final result, at least on the national level, just yesterday, the day before. So it looks like we're finally having everything shape up here with some final results. Although I think Tyler is going to tell us it's still getting a little bit sticky in some areas. First off, why don't we start real big? Tyler, do you want to tell us a little bit about how the national elections have shaped up and how that might impact POMA's efforts moving forward? Yeah, so I think the main takeaways from this election can be summed up into two things. There wasn't a red wave like everyone had predicted, and two, Pennsylvania remains firmly a purple state. So if we take a look firstly at the United States Senate, you had our current Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman versus Dr. Mehmet Oz, at least to my point, because the race was very close. Dr. Oz was defeated by John Fetterman, and John Fetterman outperformed President Biden's performance in the 2020 election in all but three of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania. And so that sets the stage for the United States Senate to be 48 Democrats, 49 Republicans between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. So POMA doesn't do a lot of national advocacy. You know, we have the the AOA for that. POMA starts with a P for Pennsylvania, so there's not a whole lot we do. So I guess either Tyler or uh, Dr. Carter, do you see the Senate race or any of the legislative impacts on a national level impacting POMA's advocacy efforts? So I'm going to steal a little bit from my takeaways from the state, but as we can see with the Senate being so close and the House being controlled by Republicans and the presidency being controlled by Democrats, (laughs) there is that mixed government. So it's either going to look a lot like gridlock or there is going to be issues that there are breakthroughs where we do have us working together across the aisle. We saw that with infrastructure. Yep. And so if an issue that POMA feels strongly about is one of those issues that is a breakthrough issue, it's going to be something that we can celebrate and get on with, but also at the same time, there's going to be some frustration because of the gridlock. Yeah. I know that when it comes to some issues, gridlock can be good. You know, if there's stuff that we really don't want to happen, sometimes that is a place to take advantage of there. Gridlock can create some stability. So sometimes I know financial markets actually like having split governments. So that's not all necessarily doom and gloom if we don't think there's a whole lot to be done. So we can talk a little bit about what the state looks like because the the level of bipartisanship that we see at the national level and in the media doesn't always trickle all the way down to the state. Tell me if I'm stealing anything from you, Tyler, but my understanding is that because we don't have printing presses in Harrisburg, (laughs) people have to get along a little bit more than they do at the national level. Yeah, there is an underlying just relationship of bipartisanship. And there has been a little bit of a discussion between some legislators whether or not COVID-19 has kind of killed that because everybody is now so distant. But there is more bipartisanship 
than in the federal capital. So what's the the state look like? I know there are some unexpected turnouts there. Yeah. So the state at the top of the ticket, we had the gubernatorial race between Attorney General Josh Shapiro and sitting state Senator Doug Mastriano and Attorney General Josh Shapiro won that race pretty handedly, I believe by 15 points, which is the highest margin for a gubernatorial race in Pennsylvania's history. One little fun fact that I do always like to mention here is this is actually the second Shapiro that is running for governor and will be governor in Pennsylvania. The first one was Milton Schapp. He had to change his name from Shapiro to Schapp in fear of anti-Semitism when he ran in the 70s. But obviously times have changed and we have Josh Shapiro proudly in the position of governor. And as his lieutenant governor, we have Austin Davis from the Allegheny County area. And so he is a member of the legislature who's been really there working hard to get things going. And it's good to see him advance. Going down- Shapiro knows a little bit about DOs, right? Yes, he does. His brother is actually an anesthesiologist and his family, everybody but him is a physician. Yeah, his father is a DO. Okay. So if we just want to jump down to the Senate level, this was the more expected result. 25 of the 50 Senate seats were up for election this year, and the current totals are 27 Republicans, 22 Democrats, and one open seat. Now, that open seat is a result of John Gordner's retirement, which came late last week. Um, And so there is a special election to fill that seat scheduled for January 31st. And we already have the first candidate's name for that. And that's Representative Linda Culver, who is from the House. Okay. I guess to follow up there with Josh Shapiro, just to kind of focus on the governor for a moment, do you think that his relationship with medicine gives us any benefits? I think it does. He is comfortable with doctors and medical practitioners. He knows that you are ex experts in your field that you do go to school for a long time and you have this expertise for a reason. And he's made it seem like he will listen to us. And so once the administration is in, it will be very exciting to see if that does follow through. And Tyler, you mentioned that his brother was an anesthesiologist. Yes. So that'll be interesting to see how his brother can provide kind of a unique perspective because we know that anesthesia is one area where the nurses that receive that higher level of training, that graduate level of training in that field of medicine, they've been kind of moving in and kind of pushing physicians aside. I don't know if that's so much in Pennsylvania as it is in other states, but I do know that there are kind of grumblings amongst the anesthesia anesthesiologists about, you know, it's harder for them to get jobs or they have less patient time because they're more managing the nurses. Is it CRNAs? Yes, it's certified registered nurse anesthetists. So I actually work on anesthesiologists for Mill Iron Goodman. So the really unique thing here is with Josh Shapiro's brother being a anesthesiologist, that's great. But the thing that should also be mentioned is back in 2021, the Pennsylvania Society of Anesthesiologists actually got a big victory that put the physician supervision requirement or physician direction requirement into statute. So that isn't able to be changed without legislative approval. So those fears are somewhat a little bit quashed by that, but also at the same time, there's always that issue of federal opt-out looming over the state. And that would have to be a gubernatorial decision. So that does go back to Josh having his anesthesiologist brother. Yeah. You know, having that conversation about, well, how will that look with nurse practitioners in primary care or, or other specialties wanting to practice independently, that may be helpful as far as, you know, our concerns about making sure that patients have access to the best care with physician-led supervision of nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Just that we appreciate our nurse practitioners and physician assistants. They provide valuable care to our patients, but we also recognize the benefit of having physician supervision so that the patients have the best care. So when it comes to scope of practice issues, do we see a lot of divide that falls down along bipartisan divide? Are Republicans on one side of the issue? Do we see Democrats on the other? Or is it more split based on personal preferences, experience, and, you know, like with Josh Shapiro, family members? In my experience, it is pretty bipartisan. It is based on experience. And if you do have a family member or you know somebody who is representative of one of those occupations, one thing that I did want to bring up specifically here was that Senator Tommy Tomlinson, who was the Senate Majority Professional Licensure Chair, 
has retired. And so that is one of the chairmanships that is kind of up in the air right now in the Senate. And while that is being figured out and who is actually going to be on the committee for the next session, those are the big questions that will ultimately impact the scope of practice. So right now, and we talked about this, you know, a little bit when we were chatting earlier, but we hear a ton in the news about federal races and what the Congress is going to look like. But it seems like it can be very difficult to find out unless you're reading a really local paper, what's happening in Harrisburg or what some of the state elections are like. And there's actually some interesting stuff happening with the legislature right now. I know that the local newspaper where I live in, in Lebanon, Pennsylvania was, you know, taken over by USA Today, and it's it's difficult sometimes to find a lot of Pennsylvania-based news. So what's the overview of the legislature? Did both houses go in one direction? Are we looking at a split here? What's the overall result going to be? And is it going to be more gridlock or going to be a little more open? So as much as I wish to say that it was going to be more open and more government was going to get stuff done and do the business of the people, the Senate has gone Republican, the gubernatorial race has gone Democratic, and the House is still kind of stuck in the middle. There are 203 members of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Right now, as it stands, there are 101 Democrats and there are 101 Republicans with one vacancy from Representative Tony DeLuca, who unfortunately passed away prior to the election and his name was not able to be pulled off the ballot. So there is a lot of political jockeying right now. There was actually a fight earlier this week in Harrisburg about when that special election would be set and whether or not the outgoing speaker, Brian Cutler, could set that or the incoming speaker, presumptuous speaker, Joanna McClinton should set that. So as we go towards January 3rd, which is swearing in day for the House and Senate, it is going to be really interesting to see if they can get any Republicans to break off or Democrats to break off to an elect a speaker. Right. So things are still a little bit chaotic there incredibly chaotic because the speaker in the house controls who is committee chairs. And so until we have a speaker, we can't form committees. And that brings me to the next point of Chairman Hicker now retiring from the House Professional Licensure Committee as the majority chair. So as it stands right now, Representative Frank Burns is the Democratic chair, and we assume that he will stay in that position, but that Republican chair is open and with so much upheaval, we're not sure where that's going to go. Well, I know the scope of practice is certainly a very important issue for, for POMA and most of our members, and it spans everything from nurse practitioners to physician assistants to anesthetists. Since we know who the likely Democrat chair would be in Representative Burns, what do we know about him? Is he someone who's one of POMA's champions? Is he someone who's more open to scope of practice issues? It was really interesting when Representative Burns became chair of professional licensure because he was very much taking time to learn about everything that was coming through the committee. And so we really haven't seen him take action on a lot of issues that have been sitting in the committee. So as we move forward into the next session, it's going to be vital that POMA and if any of its members are in his district to reach out and build that relationship. Because to be honest, I'm not sure if he's one of POMA's champions, but building that relationship is the first step to bring him closer to being a champion. Unfortunately, POMA does have a lot of very good information about where our, our members live. And if you do live in his district, I think you can certainly be expected to have someone reach out from POMA. We do have a lot of very good database information. So Seth, if you were a member in uh, Representative Burns' district and we're going to talk about scope of practice issues, what kind of message would you get across? Maybe you know, something quicker, like an elevator speech or something like that. How would you approach scope of practice? Again, I think POMA's policy statement on scope of practice is very good policy statement. I'm sure that we can share that with the members in some way. I don't have it memorized, but the gist of it is that we support physician-led medical teams where we value the physician oversight of mid-level providers such as nurse practitioners and physician assistants just because of the extra training that we have, the expertise we have in medicine and the number of hours that we've had in our training is very extensive and very thorough and our perspective tends to be a little deeper and we can help guide those nurse practitioners and physician assistants to provide the best care for our patients. 
And our main concern is that if we were to remove the physician's oversight, that there would be potentially kind of a blunting or a degrading of the care that would be provided for those patients who don't have that physician-led care. And again, that's not to disparage or to undermine the valuable contributions of nurse practitioners and physician assistants. It's just the difference in training and the length of training, the rigors of the training that we undergo to become practitioners in our fields. And the research does kind of support that. It supports that physician-led teams tend to do better in using medical dollars more appropriately in in more fiscally responsible manner and that patient outcomes tend to do a lot better when there's a physician in the care of those patients. And so those would be some quick things that we can share with our representatives as we meet with them and talk with them. So focusing on team-based care, quality outcomes, expense, you know, dollar per care, you know, and some type of unit, if you were, would kind of be the main focus of that conversation. Exactly. Okay. So I know another one of the big issues that we are certainly talking about quite a bit more is tort reform and associated issues. The Superior Court in Pennsylvania, what Supreme Court, recently brought back some of the venue rule changes where now it's very easy to get court cases moved from one venue to another. And there was a recent ruling by the Superior Court, which had some very flimsy reasoning for moving a venue to Philadelphia, which we know gives out much larger payments than other counties. And I think the main reason for justifying the move was that one of the organizations had a PO box in the city, and that was about it. So with some of the venue changes coming aboard, when it was like this previously, we had a big problem with liability insurance, where premiums went out of control. And the joke in Pennsylvania, at least in the medical community, was that it took you nine months to schedule a OB appointment. So with that looming in front of us, with a Democratic governor, a Republican Senate, and a big question mark in the House right now, where does that kind of leave us, Tyler? Are there legislative changes to get at the venue? Does this have to be kind of a, a court change where we need to come out and vote different judges in? And I guess as a corollary to that, I asked a little bit about how scope of practice breaks down on partisan lines. How does tort reform break down on partisan lines, if it does at all? Sorry, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to break it down into a couple things here. So obviously, it's going to have to be partially a court decision, but also a legislative change because we do have the Pennsylvania judicial elections coming up in the next election cycle. And so that is that opportunity to make your voices heard and make that change at the judicial level and make that impact be known. And at the legislative level, I know last session, I can't really speak for this session going forward. There were multiple discussions regarding trying to fix the localities issue, but I'm not sure with how everything's shaking out in the house and 54 new members coming in between both chambers, if that's going to be necessarily addressed. Okay. So I know that each session to session can be pretty different just kind of based on the culture. Yep. So I, I've been on the, the government affairs committee now for probably four or five years, and it's been pretty steady. Are we looking at a significant culture shift, do you think, this time with so many new members or not? I think we are possibly going to see that in the House, because if it does become a Democratic majority, that is going to change pretty much everything. And another thing that we have to look at is the Democrats haven't been in the majority in the House for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so that relationship between the Republicans and Democrats during that time is going to rule how the Democrats really treat the Republicans going forward. And so that culture is probably going to be vastly different. Do you think that opens up any opportunities for us? Or does I do. It I okay. absolutely do. With so many new members coming in, now is the perfect time to create those relationships that in two, five, ten years will make the difference. These new legislators today are going to be the legislative leaders of 10 years from now. And so getting in at the bottom floor is the most important. Creating those relationships and advocating for POMA and your profession and your patients is the best opportunity possible. So with that being said, I would probably let anyone know who's listening, if you know you have a new legislator or if you're interested in getting contacted with a current one, definitely reach out to POMA. The 
we send out a under the dome newsletter. There are emails on there that you can reach out to Andy Sandusky, who's in charge of government affairs for POMA, and he can help you with who your legislators are and even work possibly with Tyler or another member of Mill Iron Goodman to make some relationships, let you know a little bit about the uh, legislator and kind of what their policy preferences are and maybe where we have opportunities and where maybe we should not talk about certain things and approach it with quite a bit of tact. So if you're interested in making relationships, we can really help make sure that those relationships are as strong as possible by giving people some some good talking points. So Thess, you know, if people have new legislators, what other topics, you know, other than scope of practice, you know, should they make sure to think about when it comes to the public policy priority? I was just kind of thinking, and maybe this is often the case, sometimes we don't recognize the unintended consequences of elections until after agendas are set and bills are starting to be written and things like that. And so just being aware of the conversations that are being had, you know, listening to the news or or keeping track of bills that are kind of coming forward. I know that paying attention to the POMA newsletters under the dome where they kind of spell out any new legislation that may impact us as physicians. It's important to keep on top of those things and being a voice wherever you can. When you're mentioning, you know, you have to wait nine months to see your OBGYN, right? When we think of tort reform, we're not always thinking of that unintended consequences. This is delaying care for patients. And, you know, nine months is too late, right? <laughs> That's the joke. Right, sure. Um, you know, a lot of these policies aren't just about, you know, what's good for physician business. A lot of it does come down to patient care. You know, the more hostile an environment any state or community is for physicians, the the less there will be and the longer, you know, the more access issues we're going to have for patients. And that's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I think that's where we can really be advocates for our patients. It's so easy for someone to try to paint this as, oh, this is just a greedy physician wanting to protect their dollars. When really we care about our patients and we often put our patients first. That's why we have so much burnout. And that's why we have so many other issues as physicians is because we, we work really hard because we care about our patients. And so many of these issues, these are issues for us, the important issues for us to address is because we want to make sure that our patients are protected, that they receive the best care, that they have greater access to care. Those are all important issues to us. Yeah. So we had several policy wins last year. We had some scope of practice issues, which went well. The prior author form was a really big one that we were a big part of. And OMA's leadership was heavily involved in steering that. This session around, Tyler, do you think there's any big opportunities that you are seeing on the horizon for physician organizations, whether it's POMA or otherwise? I know Mill Iron Goodman has a number of other good relationships with physician organizations. I think one of the big ones that the legislature is going to be looking at is going to be telemedicine, telehealth, really wrapping that up because since the end of the pandemic, Pennsylvania has had an incredibly difficult time getting that legislation anywhere. So hopefully with this new session, we can take advantage of that. So what are the goals of the telemedicine legislation? What are the problems we're having right now with that if this legislation doesn't get enacted? So right now it basically limits physicians in where they're able to take care of patients. And it would require, without this legislation, patients are required to come into the office or be seen by a physician person. And that's not physical. currently the case because of emergency to see waivers, right? right? Yeah. The waivers. But those yeah. aren't going to last forever. Forever. And we are, have already seen during the tail end of the COVID restrictions, there were calls for the end of states of emergency. And so with that goes these waivers. So that's, we've certainly seen, I'm certain both our offices, patients who really enjoy doing telemedicine. I saw three or four patients today using telemedicine. Has the public policy group taken a strong stance on that for POMA? Oh, you're putting me on the spot there. I'm All trying right. to, I believe we have made a policy statement about telemedicine and that was a, probably a year and a half ago, maybe even just a year ago. So yeah, I'll have to refresh. I don't remember what we decided on that, but I do remember us discussing it at one of our meetings and Andy was working on the, the language and everything. So. 
Well, I'm sure most of us are are pretty supportive of continuing to expand telemedicine, right, right? Right. Where it's appropriate, obviously, there's having greater access to a physician is what we're all for. Again, we think that the benefits for our patients to having greater access to us are valuable for them, for their care and everything, but also showing caution when it's appropriate to use telemedicine. Sometimes you'll start that telemedicine visit and realize that, you know what, I need to take a look at that wound that maybe the camera of the patient, um, it just mm -hmm. really isn't sufficient, right? That's one of the benefits is you can do that quick check-in and see, oh yeah, no, actually I need you to come into the office or no, I can manage this, you know, cold or sinus infection over, over telemedicine and that's fine. Sure. So I think we're kind of coming up to the end here. So Tyler, a little bit of a mixed bag, I think overall in terms of where the state is going and still some question marks there. Anything that you think we should have talked about out, but didn't? I think we covered it all. I'm just going to throw it out there once again. We've got a lot of new members coming in. We've got 26 new committee chairs. There's a lot of education to do. And each and every one of your members at POMA is an expert and should mm -hmm. act like that when they meet with a legislator. Let them know what is best for your patients and your profession. Yeah, there's a lot of people coming in that have no experience in the medical profession or very limited experience. And they're going to know a lot about something, but they're going to rely on experts. And our experience has always been that they love when their own voters come in and talk to them about different issues. And you do have the ability, especially on the state level, to really sway someone's opinion and have some influence on it. We've definitely seen that before. And we have identified champions. And, you know, the one thing we haven't really talked about today is our political action committee, our PAC. But, you know, for our legislators that support us and our issues, you know, we do have funds available to make contributions. So, Seth, any closing thoughts or remarks or, or other topics we should discuss before we go tonight? No, I think we hit a lot of good topics and discussed. We'll probably have to do another podcast <laughs> in the future after we kind of everything, after the dust settles and we figure out what we have. That was supposed to be this one. It's a month after the election. We might have to wait till like mid-March. Yeah, yeah. mid-March or maybe June, you know. Oh yeah. man, by June, we'll be going over budget stuff. <laughs> Everyone's favorite topic. Oof. Yeah, that's always a fun fight. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the fun things, at least I think about some of these political issues is that, you know, I always describe the government affairs committee as kind of whack-a-mole. Like you never really know what's going to come up. So that's, you know, to Tyler's point, that's important why it's important. Well, that's why it's important to have such good relationships with people and you got to build them early because you don't know what's going to come up. And then you want to already have that relationship built instead of trying to build it while the walls are falling down around you. So you never really know what's going to happen. It's always exciting. Things are always changing. And, you know, Tyler, you even said earlier that one of the Senate seats, that's going to be a special election. Did you say there was a House member who's going to run? Yep. Representative Linda Culver from the Professional Licensure Committee from this past session. Okay. She's already thrown her name into the hat. And so is she currently a House member? Yes, she is. Oh, so there's, there's going to be another vacancy. Is she a, a Democrat or a... She or is a Republican a... from Columbia County. So there's kind of 101 Democrats and really kind of 100 plus one Republicans for now. Yeah. It's going to see what happens there. So depending on how that special election goes, there could be another special election that could decide the fate of everything. On top of this special election that's already been scheduled, there will have to be two additional ones for Austin Davis, who is the sitting House member from Allegheny County, who is going to become our lieutenant governor in late January. And right. Representative Summer Lee, who is a sitting House member who was actually elected to the United States Congress. So we're going to have to have those additional ones. So the House is really in flux. And if you like political maneuvering, this might be something to really keep a close eye on. So this is crazy. So this whole podcast is kind of pointless for a lot of people, right? <laughs> we'll I wouldn't say, say pointless. But we don't really know what's going on. So, all right, to that point, if I really want to follow what's happening in Harrisburg, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's tough sometimes to follow some of these stories. What's the best news source? Where should I go to, to find the dirt? Penn Live does some really great reporting. Spotlight PA, that is much more zoomed in, old-timey investigative reporting. But they do lots of really good looks at state government. I will actually work with Andy Sandusky to put together a list of resources for your members. Okay, that would be great. I'm I'm sure he can throw it into one of the under the domes that he puts out, which are always worthwhile or 3D. All right. 
Well, thanks so much for the both of you for joining us tonight. I hope this was rewarding for everyone who was listening. And if anyone has any feedback or episode ideas, please email poma at poma.org and be sure to subscribe to the Poma Does podcast series on your favorite platform or our YouTube channel where you can watch all of us in color. And we'll see everyone next time. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Poma Does. Be sure to subscribe to Poma Does wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell your friends and colleagues to tune in. Learn more about osteopathic medicine and POMA on our webpage, www.poma.org and join the conversation on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, or email us at poma at poma.org. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time for another edition of POMA Dust.